So we got brand new uniforms there in Detroit. We have a fat new contract for the highest paid player in the NFL in Stafford. Is this going to be the year the Lions finally win the division? Brendan Albert here for Adrian FedQ. Really excited to guys talk about Lions football. Adrian, let's jump into it, man. I know there's a couple big topics we want to hit off, so hit me with them. Hey, first of all, killed the intro. I still don't have my laptop. So, Brendan, you know, you're going to have to take care of the intros. I love the passion there. It was great. All right, so let's get into the Lions. Matt Stafford. So, obviously, I mean, you can understand the contract extension there. And I'll tell you what, he's been under the radar starting to play really, really well. Without a question. I mean, for a while there, he was an MVP candidate last year. So for him, he was one of those guys when his contract came up, he just happened to be playing exceptionally well. So he got paid a huge contract. He's currently the highest paid player in the NFL. Does it mean he's the best player in the NFL? No, of course not. But it's a supply and demand game. We talked about this with the Bears. Stafford, he's been playing really well. And you know what? He deserves a new contract. He deserves to get paid what he what he's getting. I have no problems with the contract, Adrian. Yeah. All right. So I'll go quickly through my quarterback rankings and, and we'll see where uh, you would kind of put them. So I don't have them in the top 10. So out, outside my top 10, I go Cam Newton and then 12 is Stafford. So I have him at like 12. Where, where do you think he's kind of at? I think that's fair. I think he's in that 8 to 12 range is probably where, where you have him. Uh, I mean, guys that are in that grouping too, you have guys like Mariota, Winston, um, of course, just like you said, you know, uh, Cam Newton there. The only difference is, is all those guys have at least won a division or, or I shouldn't say that because Winston has, but Winston's showing a lot more upside. So I certainly understand why Stafford is getting paid what he is. Realistically, in the end of the, end of the day is, hey, if you don't want to pay me, that's fine. Stafford would have left and went somewhere else. And Detroit obviously said, well, no, we don't want that. So he said, okay, we have you at hostage. We have you at gunpoint because we know there's not going to be another quarterback out there in the market. So you're going to pay overpay for me. And Detroit said, yeah, that happens. It happens all the time in the NFL. I mean, most people don't know it. But Alex Smith, I think, is the 24th highest paid player in the NFL. Brock Osweiler is like the 17th highest paid player in the NFL. Overpaying quarterbacks is just part of the game. So, you know, for those guys saying, oh, Stafford's not worth that dollars and cents, he's not. But you know what? The quarterback position is. Yeah, this is this is Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco is the perfect example, won the Super Bowl. Obviously, you're going to pay him. He just won you a goddamn Super Bowl. Now, Stafford hasn't won a Super Bowl, but that's what you do now uh, in the NFL. So, all right. So now that moves on. Uh, that, that moves us on now to Jim Caldwell, hot seat, and a bunch of different things, too, because this is a team – that flip flops every year. Mm-hmm. So before they went nine and seven last year, they go seven and nine. The year before that, they went eleven and five, nearly beat Dallas in the wild card round. And then the year before that, they went seven and nine. So what is this team? Are are, are they a nine and seven team? Or are they going to fall back down again? I think they're going to fall down to seven and nine this year. Now here's the reason I say that. When we looked at the AFC South when we did our previews realistically the a the nfc north and the nfc south are the two teams are the two divisions that realistically probably have the best caliber wild card people in them i.e you know teams like the panthers falcons bucks all of them could either win the division or be wild cards same thing with the vikings and lions they very realistically could be wild cards but the thing is is this year those divisions play each other and to me i don't think the lions are going to match up that well when they have to play the Panthers and when they have to play the Bucks, when they have to play the Saints, when they have to play the Falcons, I don't think that's going to be a good matchup for the Lions. So I have them falling to seven and nine. I think Caldwell is one of those guys where he might get fired this year. I actually think he's a better coach than he got credit. He gets credit for, but he might get fired because, like you said, Adrian, he, every year he's up and down, up and down. But here's one thing that's really under the radar: the Lions was one of the only teams in the NFL to not only have their offensive coordinator interview for head coaching jobs, but also their defensive coordinator in Terry Alston. So potentially, let's say, for example, Caldwell gets fired. One of those two guys could get the new job there in Detroit. The other one could go get a new head coaching job in Detroit too. So there really could be a a total of three main head coaching slash coordinator positions changing over in Detroit in roughly under a year from now. You know, you bring that up and and – it makes sense. I mean, that's what Tampa Bay did with Dirk Cutter, you know, hiring within. 
Uh, and I want to get into this. So Stafford, Jim Bob Cooter, not only the best name in the NFL, but a rising offensive coordinator. Stafford not making as many mistakes as years past. I credit a lot of that to Jim Bob Cooter. I mean, you have to. The other thing you have to look at is Stafford's not really taking as many chances down the field as he did in the past. Now, in the past, he also had Calvin Johnson, so you can take more chances down the field, of course. And obviously his personnel has kind of changed to more ball control, dip and dunk, West Coast kind of style. But Stafford's excelled in that transition here. You haven't really noticed it. A lot of times you do notice those type of transitions. Stafford's looked well. So, yeah, Coach Cooter, Bob, Jim Bob Cooter there has got to get a lot of credit. Yeah. All right. So let's go position by position here. So Amir Abdullah looks like he can be talented, but he can't stay on the field. And they don't really have anything else. I mean, it's a weird situation there running back. The old expression, you know, it goes with quarterbacks is, hey, if you have two rotational quarterbacks, you don't have a starter. That really applies here to Detroit in their three-headed running back situation they have. So Amir Abdul is obviously the guy that they realistically would love for, to win the job, but – as you said, Adrian, he hasn't shown that he's been able to either stay healthy or flat out separate himself from the other running backs. Theo Riddick just got a new deal, and he plays a lot of running back, but also plays a slot a lot. And then they added it, and then Zerner was the guy who all of a sudden he added a ton of goal line touches. So what's weird is if you imagine the football field, the first 20 and out, like when you were kind of in those red zones, you're probably getting Zerner in there. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the field, now that's going to split between Abdullah and Theo, depending on first down, second down, third down. And then you get in the goal line, Zenner comes back in, and now he's the goal line back. So it's a really weird dynamic. That said, it's a better situation than a lot of teams have in the running back situation. I'm sure Eagles fans would say, yeah, we would much rather take those three running backs over Blunt and Sproles and Smallwood. I don't know. So it's not a terrible running back situation. But there's clearly not a, a solidified starter there in Detroit. They were 30th in the NFL last year in rushing, and they didn't have a back run for over 70 yards in a game. That's crazy. That's insanity. So, yeah, Zach Zenner was uh, kind of a guy that kind of emerged for them later. Uh, but I'll say this. I like Theo Riddick. I like him as that receiving type of back. Uh, he's great catching balls out of the backfield. He's just not – a guy that's going to get a heavy workload, obviously, in the running game. But as a pass catcher, love him. Yeah. You know, as that scat back, third down back. Uh, but Abdullah, he's got to stay healthy. All right, so moving on to wide receivers. Uh, you know, they, they've been kind of screwed over with the whole Calvin Johnson thing a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's shit happens. So uh, Golden Tate, Marvin Jones. Uh, there's been a lot of hype about this kid, Kenny Galladay, uh, Northern Illinois product, I believe. Uh, do, do you know anything about him? Yeah, so he's another one of those big body guys. He really is a great comparison, honestly, to Marvin Jones. The interesting thing is, is when you looked at Marvin Jones, the first six weeks of the of the season, Marvin Jones shot out like a cannon and looked like, oh my gosh, this guy's going to be a stud here in Detroit. And then all of a sudden, he kind of, I don't want to say disappeared, but he really came back down to earth quickly. So when you look here at the opposite receiver position, there's going to be a nice competition between the two of them. Now, here's the good news for both of them. Golden Tate really plays the slot. They moved him to the slot now, a la what really Fritz Gerald's done there in Arizona. So realistically, both of these guys are probably going to start because of the Lions, they love to go a lot of 11 personnel, which means, guys, one running back, one tight end, three receivers. That's pretty much like their base starting you know, unit there. So if they run a lot of that looks, all three of those guys are going to get the opportunity to start. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's get to the offensive line now. So Taylor Decker, Graham Glasgow, Travis Swanson, TJ Lang, Rick Wagner. So they picked him up. Actually, did they sign him last year or did they pick him up this, this offseason? Year. Oh, it was this. Okay. So Rick Wagner is uh, – I remember like two, three years ago, he was outstanding for the Ravens, and then he stunk, and then last year he was kind of good again. I think a fair thing to say is he's really middle of the pack, which really kind of sums up exactly what he is there. Now, the other thing you got to remember, when he's playing in Baltimore, he's playing next to Marshall Yonda. You know, so yeah. the, probably, in my opinion, the best right guard. I'm not trying to be biased here. It's him, Cleccio, Semler. Oh, he but, is. 
yeah, I mean, you, you put that next to you, and life's going to get a lot easier. So they have Rick Wagner, middle of the road. We have a starting right tackle in the NFL, fine starting right tackle in the NFL. Good situation there. Right guard, bring in TJ Lang from the, from the, uh, the Packers, which is the great news because when they bring him in, not only are they making their team better, but they're also weakening the team who won the division last year. So that's a great signing there. And then when we get over to the opposite side here, left guard is the big, big, big problem. Left guard is a big issue there in Detroit, and it makes matters worse. Decker looks like he's going to be out for at least the first half of the season, it sounds like. Now, yes, they traded for Greg Robinson, but that's the good news. Oh, wow, we traded for a former first-round pick. The bad news is he kind of sucks as a starting he's all- in the NFL. So, you know, when Decker's gone, that's a big drop there in Detroit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, tight end situation. They, they still got Eric Ebron on the roster. I mean, Eric Ebron might be one of the most frustrating guys in the NFL for me because not necessarily because of him, but it's because of who you talk to. If you talk to 10 different people, you'll get five people saying, hey, he's going to keep getting, he's getting better every single year, which is true. We talk to the other five people and they say, yeah, but he's got no red zone touchdowns. He doesn't get in the end zone. And that was really what he was supposed to be. When Calvin left, everyone said, ah, now Ebron's going to be that red zone threat. He really hasn't. They, they've really done more and more stuff with trying to get Golden Tate or Anquan Bolden came in. And he got a ton of red zone touchdowns last year. So Ebron, I, I honestly don't know. I, I have no clue what he is, how good he is. I, I really can't say anything. I would say maybe he's a top 20 tight end in the NFL, maybe top 15. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to say about the guy. Man, I, I don't know where the hell to put him. I don't I – don't. I'm not even going to look. We'll just move on. Uh, defensive line. So Ziggy Ansa, dude, I, I I like loved him two three years ago, but he took a dip last year, and 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 uh, I believe he's he's heading to the pup. Correct. Ziggy Ansa had a massive decline. There's no doubt yeah. about it. Now, the, to make matters worse, the Kerry Hyder, the guy who was their leader in sacks with eight sacks last year, he's done for the year. And, so, yeah. Interior. Haloti Nada is, I guess, your best interior lineman. Honestly, it's funny because, you know, if you remember several years back when Jim Swartz was there, this was a nasty D-line. This was probably one of the best D-lines in the NFL. And now I could argue it's one of the worst. It's There's nothing here in the defensive line that really gets you excited. Yeah, they got uh, uh, Ashawn Robinson. Uh, what was he? A, was he a first-round pick last year or second, early second round? I think he slipped the second. Yeah, so, so they got him, and uh, there's really not much else. Uh, moving on to the linebackers, uh, Jared Davis, they, they drafted him from Florida. Uh, to hear Whitehead, our, our boy from, from Temple, but he's just kind of, you know, a normal, normal linebacker, average linebacker. So let's talk about the linebacker court. I mean, there's really not much there either. There's not. Really, the front seven here in Detroit is, is one of the worst in the NFL, honestly. This is another one of those defenses – if you see one of your fantasy running backs or your team is lining up against the Lions, go ahead and throw that running back in there because it's not a great front seven. Now, when I looked at the draft pick here, I was okay with them addressing a middle linebacker in the first round. It made sense to me. Yeah. But I wouldn't have gone there. I would have gone Ruben Foster. Uh, and, I, and I say that just because you know the upside for Foster is way higher than whatever Davis is going to be. So for me, I don't love the pick, but it's nice because it allows Talia Whitehead to move back to his comfort position of being an outside backer. He played inside a little bit just because of me, and he struggled there. But again, it wasn't his position of strength. So he gets kicked back outside. Davis comes inside. The nice thing about Davis is he's super athletic. He's a really physical linebacker. He's not a blitzer. He struggles heavily in in getting pressure. That's not his skill set. But as far as playing against the run in the past, he's pretty damn good. So that's okay for me as a starting middle linebacker. Just for me personally, even if I was really concerned to Foster, I would have taken him unless, and this is what my assumption is, when he took the physical for Detroit, he failed the Lions physical because of that shoulder situation. That's, I, I would probably say that's what happened. Uh, obviously with the release of DeAndre Levy during the offseason, that opened up uh, the linebacker spot. So you can understand why they went there uh, in the first round. Now let's talk – Secondary. So front seven might not be too great, but on the back end there, 
I got Darius Slay as a top 10 cornerback in the NFL. I love him. Yeah, I'm a big Darius Slay guy. Now, when he came out of Mississippi State, the really rare thing about him is not only is he really tall and lanky, but he also ran a sub 4-4 in the 40-yard dash. Usually those sub 4-4 guys are a little smaller, not necessarily the big lanky guys like Slay is. So Slay being a top 10 corner in your world, Adrian, I agree with it. I completely back that. Glover Quinn, yeah, he's been a little he's a little older coming out of New Mexico, I think probably about a decade ago now. But he's been a good safety in the NFL. You know, there's, there's nothing short there. Then you look at Tavon Wilson. He's coming off the best year of his NFL career. He's played a bunch of years bouncing back and forth between Detroit and, and the Patriots. So he's had a he's had a best year, which is awesome. And then you look at the other corner spot, Adrian, and they drafted your boy, T. Tabor. Well, uh, not my boy, but uh, <laughs> DJ Hayden, too, they signed. So it's like a couple head scratchers there. I mean, look, here's the thing. Obviously, both of those guys, we know the – the, the upside was there. DJ Hayden, I think it's I think he is what he is in the NFL. I don't think he's ever going to really excel. Tease Tabor is one of those guys. He reminded me a lot of Rondé Barber when he came out of the NFL draft, not because of the skill set, but because of where, he's, where his best ability is, isn't that cover two, playing the flats, being super aggressive, and bursting off the ball, not necessarily in vertical. Hey, hey, oh. He is a ball hawk. He just runs slow. Now, you're not wrong. I, and the thing that kind of – and this was another move that was a little bit of a head-scratcher for me there at Detroit because instead of Tease Tabor, they could have taken a Wuzier who then eventually went a couple picks later to Dallas. So I personally would have rather gone that way than go Tease Tabor. However, I understand when you put on that Florida tape, man, it's damn exciting. I can understand why you'd want to take him. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, all right. Go on to all right. So we kind of talked hot seat already, but do we want to talk uh, anybody on the hot seat in terms of the players? Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron. I mean, yeah, I, I would probably also say realistically Marvin Jones is on the hot seat because of the draft pick they they've moved there. Love Abdullah too. With with. I mean, Abdullah. He's on the hot seat because Detroit's already said we know there's a value here in Theo Riddick. That's why he got a new contract. So I don't know if they're necessarily really confident in Amir Abdullah as the future being a part of the Detroit Lions. And honestly, I would even probably say Talil Whitehead. I mean, he's he, he is what he is. They just moved on from left. There's nothing there's nothing really holding them to move on from Whitehead. Whitehead led the team to tackles last year, which is good. However, it's not like he's a solidified stud there at linebacker. He's a fine starter in the NFL, but he's easily replaceable, unfortunately. Who's underrated? Right. Honestly, Golden Tate. I'm a <laughs> okay. Big, I thought you were say like nobody. <laughs> no, I'm a big Golden Tate fan. I mean, there's not many guys in the okay. NFL who are consistent 80 to 100 catch guys, five plus touchdown guys. I really like Golden Tate a lot. All right, you go Golden Tate. I guess Darius Slay. You can say him. I mean, there there's people who probably don't even know who he is. Yeah, you're you're probably right there. I'll, I'll go Darius Slay. There we go. Stafford, too, underrated. Yeah, I think that's fair, too. Thanks. All right. Uh, fantasy guy, and then we'll take this one home. So this is what's interesting. As I just talked about the value of Theo Riddick being up because they gave him that new contract recently, I'm going to decrease him a little bit, and here's why. Theo Riddick played a ton in the slot. Well, this year they've announced that Golden Tate's going to play more in the slot. So to me – I wouldn't be surprised to see Theo Riddick's numbers drop a little bit because Golden Tate's going to take a lot of those slot receiver options away. The other thing that's possible is you think about like a domino effect. Domino effect could be Golden Tate takes most of the slot opportunities, so then most of the running back opportunities is going to go to Theo, so now Amir Abdullah is even lower. However, everything you've seen in the preseason, Amir Abdullah has looked really freaking good. He's looked really good in the preseason, but – Look, until you do the regular season, I have very little faith on you. So to me, I like Golden Tate. If you're a PPR league guy like me, I'm a big fan of him taking as a PPR number two, maybe a really high number three. Here's what I'll say about him. Because I like him when he's on the field. He's, he's got that jump-cutting ability. Uh, he makes people miss in space. Not that he's LaShawn McCoy, but there's a little bit of that in there. He, but but when you can't consistently stay on the field, that's – that's been the problem, obviously. So, all right, we'll wrap it up right there. That's our Lions preview. We've got two more to do. Vikings and Packers. Tune in. Appreciate it, guys.